At 50, Rabindranath Thakur wrote Jibon Sriti, his premature autobiography. Naturally, much of his colourful 80-year-long life remains untouched here. Sritir pate jibani chobi ki aankhiya jai jani na. Itu jayi aankhuk, shi chobi aankhye. অর্থাৎ যাহা কিছু ঘটিতেছে তার অবিকল নকল রাখিবার জন্য সে তুলি হাতে বসিয়া নাই সে আপনার অভিরুচি অনুসারে কত কি বাদ দেয় কত কি রাখে কত বড়কে ছোট করে ছোটকে বড় করিয়া তোলে সে আগের জিনিসকে পাচ্ছে ও পাছে জিনিসকে আগে সাজাইতে বিন্দুমাত্র দ্বিধা করে না বস্তুত তার কাজই ছবি আঁকা ইতিহাস লেখানো Some say this is his first photograph. What he looked like before, we can only imagine. This little boy was born on 7th of May, 1861, in this palatial house of Calcutta. Then, the capital of British India. This house, in the northern part of the city, stood apart from all others, ever in pursuit of knowledge, daringly progressive lifestyle, multifarious cultural activities. The youngest prince of the palace, however, was left to grow up as a commoner. As a child, Roby was left in the care of cooks and maids. Except on Sunday mornings, when his mother supervised his bath, had him scrubbed and rubbed with homemade fairness packs. She considered Roby, the youngest of her 14 children, to be too dark. Otherwise, he was left pretty much to his own devices. Splendid isolation let his imagination run. A loner and an introvert, maybe, already his mind traveling far ahead of time.
his poetic spirit is first stirred, he recalls, by the simple charm of a line in a Bengali primer, Jol Pade, Pata Nore, Raindrops, Leaves Toss. His taste for open education, unbound by classroom routine, may have been unknowingly sown right here and led him to start an open-air experimental school in the countryside many, many years later. Rabindranath's family has a long dramatic history of ups and downs. Shunned generations ago as low-caste Pirali Brahmins for the offense of merely tasting Muslim food, one of his early ancestors moved from Joshore in East Bengal to Calcutta. They were one of the first Bengali business families. Robitaku's grandfather, Prince Darukanath Tagore, was considered another sinner, forbidden by his wife, Digambari Devi, from entering the household shrine for being a religious iconoclast and also having dared cross the Kalapani to visit Queen Victoria. Devendranath Thakur, Darokanath's eldest son, chose to embrace the new Brahmo religion introduced by Raja Ram Mohan Rai, a religion minus the clutter of a myriad gods and goddesses, free from the superstitious strictures of all sorts, a religion following the essence of the ancient Vedas and Upanishads. Being ostracized by society liberated this family from conforming to mere convention and in a freedom to discard the irrational habits of thought perpetuated by the mainstream. No. Roby grew up in an atmosphere free of orthodoxies, more radical, more rooted in the core texts of ancient India. We'll never know when or how these prayer meetings sowed in his heart the first seeds of Vedic spiritualism and bathed his mind with music. At age 12, his father takes him on his first holiday. This was the first of many journeys he would take over land and sea. An ever curious mind, ready to explore the unknown from the depths of the human psyche, to the mysteries of the universe, even to the spirit world and life beyond death. By the time they reached Bolpur, it was dark. On their way to his father's house, named Shantiniketan, the abode of peace, Robi closed his eyes and waited for next morning to gain his first glimpse of this strange land. That abode of peace is almost unrecognizable today. It is a tourist attraction of sorts. Here, Robi Thakur, as I prefer to call him, himself seems to look like a brand name, a little else. Robi opens his eyes at dawn. For the first time, he sees a vast horizon open to the sky. He doesn't know then that this very place would one day be linked with his own name more than his father's. For young Ruby, 
it is a liberating experience, a time for discovery, for strange adventures, and a rude shock. It haunted him in curious ways. एक बार दुई एक दिन चुनो देव घरे जाई कोलिकता एक पीरी बार शुमाई रात्रेर गाड़ी ते शॉपनो दिखलाम कोने एक मंदिरे शिंगली रूपोर बोली रोकतेचिन हो देखिया इति बालिका उतन तो कोरुं बैकुलोतर शंगे ताहर बाप के जिग्गशा कोडिते छे बाबा एकी इजे रोक तो जागिया उठिया ही मुने हुइलो इति अमर शॉपनो � From Bolpur to the Himalayas, the journey continues. Father and son coming closer together through bonds of affection, lessons in discipline, and a deep oneness of spirit. Ek ek din dekhi tam pita gaye ekhani lal shal puriya hathe ekti mumbati shejloya nishobdo shonjor ne choliya chen. उपासना करते जाते हैं। रूबी वर्स 14, व्हेन इस माता शारुदा देवी डाइड इन द स्मॉल आर्स ऑफ 8 मार्च 1875। ही सो हर लेड आउट फॉर हर लास्ट जर्नी नेक्स्ट मॉर्निंग एस इफ इन पीसफुल स्लंबर his first encounter with death was not so devastating. The more lasting impact embedded in his mind forever was the image of his father seated in serene meditation. A lesson that would serve him in subsequent encounters with death. Jagi chho shayone shapone Roye chho nayone nayone Nayono tomare paaye na dekhi te One school after the other. And then, at 15, the rebel within him suddenly raises his head. What are you doing? Why are you doing this? Son, are you going to go to the school? Are you going to go to the school? No, no, Robi. No, 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 no. स्कूले जाबे ना पढ़ा सुना कर बे ना बहुत दुलो के चले मुख्य है थाक बे आ ओमुन करे बोल चेन क्या नो कौनो गो वो आजा रिश्कूले जाबे ने दिन मुद्धन है, खूब मेघ कोरिया चे। ये मेघला दिन एक छाया घनु अबुकाशी रानुंदे, बाड़ी भीतरे एक घोरे, खाटे रूपो रूपोड़ हुईया पुड़िया, एक ट स्लेट लोईया लिखिलाम, गहना कुसुमा कुंजमाजे, लिखिया भारी खुशी हुईलाम। Oh, oh, oh. 
কোনো কিছুর উপর ভরসা না রাখিয়া আপন মনে কেবল কবিতার খাতা ভরাইতে লাগিলাম সে লেখাও তেমনি মনের মধ্যে আর কিছুই নাই কেবল তপ্ত বাষ্প আছে সেই বাষ্প ভরা বুদ্বুদ রাশি সেই আবেগের ফেনিলতা অলস কল্পনার আবর্তের টানে পাক খাইয়া নিরর্থকভাবে ঘুরিতে লাগিল তাহার মধ্যে বস্তু যাহা কিছু ছিল তাহা আমার নহে সে অন্য কবিদের অনুকরণ উহার মধ্যে আমার যেটুকু সে কেবল একটা অশান্তি ভেতরকার একটা দুরন্ত আক্ষেপ সাহিত্যে বউ ঠাকুরানির প্রবল অনুরাগ ছিল বাংলা বই তিনি যে পড়িতেন কেবল সময় কাটাইবার জন্য তাহা নহে তাহা যথার্থই তিনি সমস্ত মন দিয়া উপভোগ করিতেন তাহার সাহিত্য চর্চায় আমি অংশী ছিলাম In 1878, a 17-year-old stripling is ready to sail to England to complete his formal education. But before that, someone must help him come out of his cocoon, acquire some English polish. A four-month stopover in Bombay is recommended. Here, he's turned over to the charge of the lovely Annapurna, daughter of a family friend, freshly returned from England. You must never wear a beard. Anna had told him, Don't let anything hide the outline of your face. We all know that it was a request which he obviously didn't keep. But 27 years later, he did shave off his beard once. when his father died. But by then, Anna was no more. She had married and settled in Edinburgh, where she died of tuberculosis at the age of 36. In 1878, a 17-year-old Robindranath reaches England to complete his education. But much more than textbooks, it is young English ladies and old Irish melodies that stimulate his ever-curious mind. But dark English winters depress him so much, he wants to run back home. He writes long letters describing all his experiences and his longing to return to his familiar surroundings. And finally, Robindranath comes back home without a law degree to a cold reception. Paragot, Silpot, Sandez, Mukundo, 
Roby had brought immense treasures home, which no one appreciated, except for Kadumburi, his sister-in-law. They find soulmates in each other. She is his muse. And yet he names her Hecate after one of the witches in Macbeth, whose spell he could never escape. His novella, Noshtonir, The Broken Nest, recalls this relationship in all its stolen moments of tenderness. On December 9, 1883, Robindranath was compelled by his family to marry Bhavutarini Rai Chaudhuri, a 10-year-old girl from a humble Brahmin family from a distant provincial town, Joshua of East Bengal. The wedding invitation is written by Robindranath himself. On the auspicious day of the coming Sunday of 24th Agrohayam, my close relative, Sriman Robindranath Thakur, will be married at an auspicious hour. We would be grateful if you could join us on that occasion in the evening at number 6 Jorashaku at Devendranath Thakur's house to participate in the wedding celebrations. Yours sincerely, Sri Robindranath Thakur. There's a wry humor in this, of course, but also a deliberate detachment, like a split personality almost. One, bound by social convention, is being married off by Rabindranath himself. His wife's old-fashioned Hindu name is changed to Mrinalini. And then it's time for a total makeover. To the standards of the sophisticated Jorashanko family and its glamorous youngest son. Four months after the wedding, Ruby's Hecate killed herself. A suicide note was destroyed at the command of the Grand Patriarch, Devendranath, and the whole scandalous episode was hushed up. But speculation is rife even to this day. They say she was neurotic and jealous of her husband's affair with a certain famous stage actress, frustrated because she couldn't bear children. And the final blow, of course, was Ruby's marriage. For the poet, it is a tragedy impossible to bear. Try as he might. He cannot emulate his father's serene composure.
গেল তাই আপন মনে বসে আছি কুসুম সে ঢেউয়ের মতন ভেসে গেছে চাঁদের আলোর দিয়ে গেছে যেখান দিয়ে হেসে গেছে বাড়ির ছাদে একলা গভীর অন্ধকারে মৃত্যু রাজ্যের কোন একটা চূড়ার উপরকার একটা ধ্বজ পতাকা তাহার কালো পাথরের তরুণদারের উপরে আঁক পাড়া কোনো একটা অক্ষর কিংবা একটা চিহ্ন দেখিবার জন্য আমি যেন সমস্ত রাত্রিটার উপর অন্ধের মতো দুই হাত বুলাইয়া ফিরিতাম নিউজ অফ ইস ফ্রান্টিক স্টেট রিচ ইস ইস ফাদার হু ইজ এজ ইউজুয়াল আপ ইন দ্য হিমালয়স ফ্রম দ্য চেঞ্জ অফ এয়ার ইজ প্রেসক্রাইবড So, they make him secretary of the Adi Brahmo Shamaj, an editor of a new magazine, Shadhuna, to busy his mind with matters more spiritual. Thus, chastened for some years, the next order from up there is to go off to manage the family estates in Shilaidaho, now in Bangladesh. The young landlord meets his subjects for the first time. He insists that the high throne reserved for him be removed because he wants to sit on the floor at the same level with his people and break the traditional barrier between the ruler and the ruled. There is a buddhi, a vivejana. আপনাদের বুঝিয়ে বললে আপনারা বুঝবেন এই সত্য আমাদের মানতেই হবে উই সি দিস আইডিওলজি মুসলমান This was another world of rivers and waterways. A city bred individuals first exposure to the real India. To humble villagers far too content with their lot. By this time, Kadamburi had settled down somewhere in the lower reaches of his consciousness. He was hungry for new intellectual companionship which he found in his well-read English educated literature loving niece Indira Between 1889 and 1895 
He writes almost 250 letters to her. Funny, lyrical, vivid, exuberant. So different from the warm, domestic exchanges. Practical, yet profound letters he wrote to his wife. Perhaps his vivid personal letters to Indira mark the beginning of a new long-distance relationship. One of the many barely physical, mostly platonic love interests he would have over the years. An expression surely of enormous appetite for life and the great self-restraint he practiced to stay within the bounds of social propriety. এই নিয়ে খসেদপুরের বকেয়া তিন মাস হল গত মাসেও তোমাকে স্মরণ করিয়েছি স্মরণ আছে বাবা মশাই আমি তাগাদা দিয়েছি নিজে গিয়েছিলে নাকি লোক পাঠিয়েছ আমি চিঠি পাঠিয়েছি অহেতুক বিবাদ বলো প্রয়োগ আমার ইচ্ছে করে না বাবা মশাই বিবাদের কথা বলছি না কিন্তু জমিদারিতে পত্র সাহিত্যের কোনো স্থান নেই হয় নিজে যাও নয় লোক পাঠাও ইচ ডে হি স্টোস হিজ নিউ এক্সপিরিয়েন্সেস as he engages with the root problems on the ground. tries to write short stories about ordinary people full of sensitive details and a stark realism at the same time his lyrical outpourings acquire a mystical hue ছিলেন বাবা মশাই শুনলাম তুমি নাকি খুটি বাড়িতে থাকার পার তুলেই দিয়েছ বোটে আমার ভালো লাগে বাবা মশাই কতটা আকাশ দেখতে পাই কতটা জল দূর দিগন্তে মনে হয় শুধু আকাশ আর জল দেখলেই চলবে জমিটাও যে দেখতে হবে সেটা রাত্রে তারাগুলো কেমন যেন স্পষ্ট হয়ে ওঠে মনে আছে 
বাবা মশাই আপনি আমাকে কাল পুরুষ চিনিয়েছিলাম মনে আছে জানো জ্যোতিষাস্ত্রে কালপুরুষকে নিয়ে এক অদ্ভুত কুসংস্কার আছে কিংবদন্তিও বলতে পারো কিংবদন্তি কালপুরুষের প্রভাবে মানুষ গৃহত্যাগী হয় আপনি আর একা একা মুসরিতে থাকবেন না বাবা মশাই আমাদের দুশ্চিন্তা হয় কালপুরুষের একটা ইংরেজি নাম তোমাকে শিখিয়েছিলাম মনে আছে In real time, however, the country is in turmoil. The nationalist movement is taking off. Protests resound in the streets of Calcutta. The poet feels like a truant schoolboy playing his flute far away from the main action. His conscience compels him to serve the cause of freedom. For a proud, free-spirited young man like Rabindranath, the struggle against British imperialism was profoundly to be desired. But not through violence, nor aggressive nationalism. Generally disgusted by the growing mass hysteria and emotionalism encouraged by callous political leaders, he was absolutely horrified by the violence that started erupting. Terrorism had raised its ugly head. Feeling an outcast in mainstream politics, Rovindranath decides to return to Bolpur. Our next trip to Shantiniketa, this time by car. We just had to catch the monsoon, say it to be the poet's favorite season. Through the car windows, the rain looked truly poetic. But at one point, the convoy had to stop. 
The road ahead was completely flooded, risky to cross. The mud, the slush, it was too much for us, the city bred people to take. Finally, we were directed to take a longer route. And now, the snow poetry left in the rain. All we saw were vast lakes on either side, drowning the paddy fields and village huts and left the people homeless. I guess one has to experience this dismal reality, the real India, before entering the land of his poetry. The notoriously truant schoolboy Rovindranath starts his dream school, Bolpur Brahmachodjo Vidyalaya an open-air school in keeping with ancient Vedic ashram traditions against the British model forced on India to provide a pool of obedient clerks. This, perhaps, is the first time he sets up a household of his own with his wife Mrinalini and their four children. Rabindranath's bonding with his wife was deep and sincere, invisible to the public eye. She gave him ample space to create his own world and she remained in the background as his unglamorous wife. A balancing effect on his quicksilver personality. But the city calls him back again in 1905. In protest against the proposed partition of Bengal along communal lines, we see him plunge into social action. October 15, 1905. The women of Jurashako stitch stacks of rakhis all night long. Next morning finds a barefoot Rabindranath out on the streets with families and friends to tie friendship bands on each other. Poet ties Rakhis even on Muslims as a symbol of Brother Lila. Rabindranath 
wrote almost two dozen patriotic songs at this time. The impact of such occasional songs is usually short-lived, but our poet has infused them with such eternal appeal that they continue to inspire generations of Bengalis, even today. The new century sees death stalking him, stealthily, relentlessly. Mrinalini, his companion for 19 years, dies in November 1902. Renuka, his second daughter, dies nine months later. His father and guru, Mohorshi Devendranath, dies in January 1905. In 1907, 23rd November, on the fifth death anniversary of his wife, his youngest son, Shumindranath, a lovely boy of 11, dies of cholera. He remembers Shomi's death 25 years later as the most poignant sorrow of his life. Sitting alone in the dark in an adjoining room, he prayed intently for his dying son to pass away into his next stage of existence in perfect peace. My mind seemed to float in a sky where there was neither darkness nor light but a profound depth of calm, a boundless sea of consciousness without a ripple or murmur. I felt like a father who had sent his son across the sea, relieved to learn of his safe arrival. In March 1912, a bout of illness took him back to Shilaidaho for a rest cure. Mango blossoms were in bloom there. Spring was in the air. He couldn't remain idle for long. Yet, he didn't have the energy to write anything new. So, he started translating Gitanjali as a mental exercise to recapture through another language the feast of joy he had felt in days gone by. The story of the passage of those scribbled notes through literary circles in England and Europe is quite well known. A year later, on an early evening in November, a telegram arrives at Shantiniketan. It has been redirected from Jorashanko his Calcutta address. It was news of the Nobel Prize for Literature carried all the way from Sweden through the dusty village roads of Bolpur, leaving the local folk unmoved. And its recipient too, who seemed equally unperturbed. He is said to have handed the telegram to a colleague in Shantiniketan and said in a jest, here comes the money for your sewage system. He knew all too well how fleeting could be any joy, any fame. In May 1918, Madhuri Lata, his beloved firstborn, finally passed away. With the image of his father in deep meditation in mind, he mourned the loss of his favorite Bailey through engagement with a higher purpose.
he felt the time was long overdue to prepare ground for the religion of man to be practiced as a way of life. Just as many of us find a larger family beyond blood relationships, Rabindranath has envisaged a family embracing all humanity. Nineteen eighty, Vishu Bharati was founded on the twenty second of December, though it was formally inaugurated in nineteen twenty one. Its motto, where the whole world meets in one nest, here he would gather the best minds from east and west, from all over India and from overseas. To him, Vishu Bharati would represent. the quintessential wisdom of india nurtured and nourished through ages of give and take with the rest of the world we see all kinds of things about rabindranath we find his english rather stilted his poetry too airy fairy his head too up in the clouds that he never stepped out of his ivory tower for the cause of the common man but that one single letter of protest was an act of courage unmatched to this day yes we are talking about the massacre of innocents at jallianwala bag While the nationalists were busy negotiating for seats in the parliament, and even the firebrand politicians were scared to protest, one solitary voice disproved all those allegations against him. He resigned his knighthood like a torn, discarded garment. His ringing prose became more poignant than any poetry he ever composed. His English rose to the occasion in an exemplary style and cut the rulers quick. His compassion spilled out spontaneously for some distant countryman whose martyrdom was buried in hushed silence. Contrary to a widely held notion that the title Mahatma was given by Rabindranath to the father of the nation he used this adjective to refer to Gandhi more frequently in later years despite many open conflicts and disagreements on strategy the respect the two men had for each other cannot be doubted and yet no two persons both great in their own ways would be so radically different from each other in september 1921 there was a clandestine meeting between gandhi and rabindranath at jura shankar gandhi requested the poet to support his civil disobedience movement rabindranath was critical of the selfish and short-sighted nationalism the conversation went something like this rabindranath says Suppose you succeed in driving the British out. What happens then? Do you really believe that the Hindu and the Muslim will live together forever? Gandhi says with Gurudev, "You know very well my whole program is based on non-violence." You're a poet, Gurudev. You believe in peace, don't you? So join me. Let's work for it together. Rabindran stands up slowly, walks to the window, looks out, and gestures at Gandhi. Come, look down there and see what your so-called non-violent followers are up to. Is that non-violence, Gandhi? 
The non-cooperators have stolen pieces of foreign made clothes from the Chitpur Bazaar nearby and lit bonfire with it. Rubin sighs. It's easy to unleash emotions. It's far more difficult to control them. Think about it. Nineteen twenty-six, Potsdam, Germany. A little brown wooden house on a hillock, with a roof of red tiles. Tall palm trees surround it like watchmen. After a profound philosophical discussion with Albert Einstein, Robindranath and his companion are on their way again. Come here, come here, come. सत्य बोल गुरुदेव देखे बसुन अपनी अच्छा एलबार्ट तो गुणी मानूष बुद्धिमान मानूष जोर बुझते चाहे ना मन टे बंध कर रेखे नीले आरोप देखल ना जानलुम ना एक घर मध्य आई से टेबिल बोले मेने आर चेतना आगे बुल्बे टेबिल तब तो टेबिल है क्योंकि वो तो सत्य आ गुरुदेव ये सत्यता अपनी अस्वीकार करबें कि सबुज गाचर पता सबुज से बोले दिल चेतना चेतना जेटा के जे भाव सत्य बोले स्वीकार कर सत्य मानुषे चेतनार बिरे को सत्य नहीं विज्ञानी शेष बोलें बटे मिस्टर टेगोर बोधाय अपन थे बसि धार्मिक All his life the poet had amused himself scribbling and doodling over the corrections he made in his writings we see them strewn across all his manuscripts some like prehistoric creatures some dark eyes peering through dense ink 
imaginary human forms, or simply leaves and ferns. We were all quite familiar with these playful forays he made with pen and ink, right up to the age of 70. But when he took up a paintbrush in his old age, he seemed to embrace a new love, a whole new means of expression, through which he could break all conventional norms of creation in verse or prose. No rules, no grammar, just uninhibited alliance with his new love, which opened new vistas for Indian art. His sense of visual aesthetics finds expression in many ways. He keeps building new houses, shifting around experimentally with new styles of oriental architecture and decor, almost as a metaphor for his all eclectic mind. Far removed from the original building in the campus, Shantiniketan Griho, a two-story mansion built by his father, in the typical British colonial style. Rabindranath mainly stays in Udayan. The next house he built was Konark. The third was a mud house, Shamuli, inspired by the local villages. He thought this would be his final refuge. Still, as an afterthought, he shifts to a small one-story bungalow called Punoshcho. And finally, he settles for a north-facing house, Udichi. But, like all mortals, his physical being starts letting him down. Yet, his vigorous mind still continues to travel. Through the wondrous faces of nature, through all the human foibles and fantasies, the lessons they had taught him, and the new experiences yet to be gathered. One fine day, the poet decides to shear off the tresses he had been so fond of. He has a wry smile on his face as he says, Someday, I had to unburden myself. In 1939, Rabindranath was ailing severely, unable to get out of bed. He is almost like Amul from Dark Ghor, a play he has written in 1911 about a little ailing boy waiting for an invitation from the king, a poetic metaphor for death. The play is being re-rehearsed by the boys of Shanti Niketan for a new performance. 
the poet wishes to add a few new songs to it and writes Shomukhe Shanti Barabar. But on second thoughts, he puts it away, reserving it for his own funeral. However, Daghor was not staged this time. On 25th July 1941, the poet leaves Shantiniketan for Calcutta. And thence, for the longest journey he would ever make, Rubindranath Thakur passed away on August 7, 1941. Away from his beloved Bengal, away from his land of the Vedas and Upanishads, away from the world he so passionately embraced, still unafraid, still alone. In 1942, one year after the poet died, Janu Skorzak, a Jewish physician and cultural activist, staged Rabindranath's play Daggor, the post office, in Warsaw, performed by the children of the Auschwitz concentration camp. It was to prepare the children for death in the gas chambers. Since then, the world has faced many holocausts, many genocides, countless conflagrations, an endless cycle of violence. But that reassuring voice, fear not, the fire will not touch you, still raises faint echoes in those who have the heart to hear. Mudhuru Tumar Shish Jinnah